Okay, lesson lesson 94, and we and we are looking at exchange rates. Just a quick uh, recap because we've already been through this previously is <clears throat> how are exchange rates determined in a freely floating exchange rate system? They're determined by the supply and demand of that particular currency. And I've got down here four things that will influence four things that will influence the exchange rate. If speculators suddenly think your exchange rate's a really good bet, then that will increase the demand for sterling because they will put their money into, into your country. If the interest rate goes up, that will also increase the demand for sterling. If your country attracts loads of foreign direct investment, that will increase the demand for sterling. And if you sell more exports, that will also increase the demand for sterling. I've also missed off here, if you, if, uh, you print money, sorry, I shouldn't use the word print money because we don't do that. We electronically create money. Then speculators will think your currency is not going to be worth as much. So therefore, in that case, they will sell sterling. So the exchange rate is determined by lots and lots of uh, different, different factors. The next question from there is, okay, so how can the government influence the exchange rate? Well, it can go out and it can buy some of your currency to increase it. Although these days, our governments do not have as much money as the speculators, so it's probably not gonna have a very big impact. And ever since Gordon Brown sold all our gold, uh, gold blocks at $250 an ounce, when they're now worth $1,300 an ounce, we haven't got a lot of money left. So that's pretty unlikely. If you wanted to print money, that would reduce the exchange rate. Now, I think they probably wanted, uh, the government was not unhappy when, sorry, the MPC was not unhappy when they printed money and it decreased the exchange rate. I think that was a, a risk worth taking. Uh, actually, I'm just thinking to myself on here, if you have brilliant supply side, of course, then eventually you're gonna sell more exports and that will either increase the exchange rate or it could also attract more foreign direct investment. But the way that most candidates are going to talk about this is when you can increase the interest rate, that will provide an incentive for investors to invest in your country. Hot money will move into your country, hence the demand for sterling will rise and the demand for your currency will go up. Okay, lesson 94 finished. Okay, this is lesson 94, and here we're talking about fixed and floating exchange rates. Now, in a way, I think this argument is a little bit out of date, although it's quite a useful argument to have, because most exchange rates, in fact, I think virtually all exchange rates, as far as I know in the world today, are floating. Now I'm going to be hung up on that answer. The euro is a floating exchange rate. Okay, within, within Europe, all prices are fixed, but it's because there are lots of different countries, but it's actually a floating exchange rate. Uh, the UK has obviously got a floating exchange rate. The Chinese exchange rate is a floating exchange rate, but it's more managed by their government because really their exchange rate should be increasing. Uh, however, they're obviously buying up dollars and they're selling their own currency, so their exchange rate doesn't, doesn't rise. Right, however, in the past, under the Bretton Woods system, under the gold standard system, we used to have a fixed exchange rate. It's quite useful to see what are the advantages of a fixed exchange rate. Although these days with speculators, you could almost say it's very, very difficult to actually have a fixed exchange rate, as you will find out as I go through this talk. Okay, so the main advantage of a fixed exchange rate is that it creates discipline. Now, I always say that to my students, and at this stage they, they switch off, which is why I'm just doing this one little subject on here. Now, the reason why it creates discipline is because as soon as your country either has inflation or a trade deficit, it has to tackle that problem quickly. Right, so let's assume it has inflation first of all. So our inflation rate is 10%, Germany's is 2%, we will quickly lose competitiveness. So therefore our firms will have to become more efficient to survive. So overall they won't give into wage demands. So therefore inflation is more likely to fall. Okay, so that's the first thing. If you have a trade deficit, right, unless the government can continue to buy sterling, 
which it can't do because it's going to run out of cash eventually, it would have to try and reduce that trade deficit quickly. And to reduce that trade deficit quickly, it can either reduce demand, which reduces imports, which is never a favoured approach, or it will have to adapt, adopt strong supply side policies. So therefore, a fixed exchange rate creates discipline because it makes you tackle problems quickly. It's the key thing. And also another big advantage is you know what price you're going to get for your exports and imports. So that leads to stability and that leads to more investments. Now, students will get this argument, but I, I've just marked a paper where they've done a question on the exchange rate, which is not popular, but nobody got this argument here. All right. So it makes you tackle problems straight away. And if we go back to the exchange rate mechanism, which is the last time we didn't have a, yet a semi-fixed exchange rate here, if you remember from the previous lesson, just go, quickly go over it again, was we had a trade deficit down here. So therefore we had to increase the demand for sterling. So therefore we had to have high interest rates to, to attract top money into the UK. So we did all of that, but the speculators knew that we couldn't survive because they knew our trade deficits were too much. So eventually they just kept on selling sterling and eventually we came out of the exchange rate mechanism, which was a complete disaster for the UK. But the reason why we joined it was because it would force the UK government to reduce inflation to remain competitive and by having a high exchange rate, it, for, it would force our businesses also to become more competitive. And because it was fixed with the German Deutschmarks, we would hopefully mirror what Germany did. OK, so that's it creates discipline. So that's the idea behind a, a fixed exchange rate. But in a sense, we have the Monetary Policy Committee now to look after the rate of inflation. OK, that's one of their jobs. All right. I'm in favour of floating exchange rates. Because if you have a trade deficit, then what should happen is the exchange rate should fall. And once the exchange rate falls, then your balance of payments will improve, assuming the Marshall Lerner and J curve effect. And the J curve is going to get worse because of the J curve. Sorry, in the short run, it's going to get worse because of the J curve. But hopefully the marginal, Marshall Lerner question will hold in the long run. And eventually the balance of payments will improve. And I call that, and one exam paper called it, the beauty of floating exchange rates. It allows you to have an independent monetary policy. So right now we want to stimulate the UK economy. So therefore we have a low interest rate. We don't have to worry about hot money going abroad. And therefore we can also reduce the exchange rate. And therefore we can rebalance the UK economy. So having a floating exchange rate is critical. Now I agree with everyone else who says, well, the problem of floating exchange rate is every time we, we, are, we lack competitiveness or our inflation rate is higher than someone else's, we just reduce the exchange rate, which of course is correct. However, the UK is in such a mess really in terms of its trade deficit that we have to decrease the exchange rate. And hopefully at the same time, we will also introduce supply side policies, firstly to make us more competitive, but also that will help to reduce cost push and demand put inflation. So therefore, in reality, an exchange rate essay, which students always seem to find very, very difficult, is all about, OK, is all about having the flexibility in your monetary policy to do what you want to do, unlike the RM, OK, but also hopefully a floating exchange rate will get rid of the trade deficit. OK, it hasn't worked in the UK, but eventually the UK will rebalance its economy towards making uh, producing its own goods etc the manufacturing sector will get big will actually get bigger and will start to have a smaller trade deficit because eventually as i said before if you, if you have a trade deficit for long enough the economy is going to crash whether it's this year whether it's in 10 years time at some stage it will have real real problems so affording exchange rate is fine i think if you also have strong supply side policies However, the main disadvantage of it is, is that it lacks the discipline in terms of tackling those problems immediately. I hope you understood that. This is the, uh, sorry, this is lesson 94. This is the Euro. And this is actually quite an easy, quite an easy lesson because most of you will know that the Euro is a bit of a disaster. So there's no way the, U the UK would want to join the Euro. But why is that? And the biggest reason is because we would lose our, our independent monetary policy. And as you know, as you've been through these talks, 
one of the reasons probably why the UK is coming out of recession is because its monetary policy via low interest rates, low exchange rates and printing money has been very aggressive and hence that has led to an increase in demand unlike Europe which has been much slower to react. However, we've got to look at the theory and the theory says this. Obviously, if we were in the euro, we wouldn't have to change our exchange rate all the time and that's going to save us money. There's clearly much greater price transparency if we were in the euro because everything would be priced up in euros. It's rumoured that we would probably get more investments if we were in the euro, although I'm not quite so sure about that because one of the advantages right now is that our exchange rate is falling, so it's going to be cheaper for other countries to buy into the UK and when they do come to the UK, we'll also have a lower, a lower exchange rate. So not only will we have a more flexible labour market, we'll also have a lower exchange rate. I suppose then if the exchange rate went up, then that would not be so good for those, for those firms that had come in in the first place. Uh, one of the reasons for joining was mainly, I suppose, because the macroeconomic management of Germany had been so good for so long. But that's Germany. Germany, <clears throat> Germany is a very efficient economy. It's got a very good relationship between the workers and the management. It's got the Mitte's land. There are lots of reasons why Germany is successful. And another one is their economic policies have probably been quite good. But you can't replicate what's happening in Germany for the rest of Europe. The Italians are not like the Germans, the Greeks are not like the Italians, <coughs> are not like the Germans, and the UK are a bit more like the Germans and the Greeks, but yeah, there's lots of different cultures within there. And actually, the European Central Bank's track record has actually been quite poor in terms of managing all of the crises. And the other reason is because if you have a if you have good monetary policy, the same eurozone for the whole country, same interest rates, same exchange rate, you eventually might move on to fiscal policy, and then you become one great big federal state, a bit like America. However, that all seems unlikely, and there's a lot of problems with the euro right now. So the big disadvantages of the euro is. Primarily, you lose your policy independence. You can't use your low interest rates or low exchange rates. And so you talk about right now, the UK is a low interest rate and a low exchange rate, and that's why it's getting better. We've done enough of that. You've also got a one policy for all the countries, which relates to the first one. And right now, there's a real problem in Europe because Germany has a very big trade surplus, 5% of GDP. Greece has a large trade deficit of 11% or sorry, 10% of GDP. Now, because of that, the euro has not as fallen, has, has not fallen enough for countries like Greece, Spain and Portugal, although it's way too low for Germany. So Germany continues to sell its products because the euro is too low for Germany, but it's way, way, way too high for Greece, Spain and Portugal. So there is one argument out there that what should happen is that Germany should leave the euro and then the euro would fall and all these countries would be far better off. So these countries have really suffered by being in the eurozone. So should, should the UK join the euro? Well, obviously right now we shouldn't. So we're doing pretty well outside the euro, eurozone and uh, the electorate wouldn't allow us to join the euro anyway. However, we can say that the single market is still a good idea. However, maybe we aren't pursuing brick and mint enough that if we left the euro, then we would have policies more, more favoured to those countries and America as well. But fundamentally, the euro is not working. So there's no way that we want to join the eurozone, primarily because we would lose independence over our policy. And uh, we have a trade deficit like Greece, so we want a lower exchange rate. And if we join the euro, uh, okay, the European, uh, if we did join the euro, in fact, the, the, the eurozone surplus would move into a deficit, but that's simply because the UK had joined them. Right, okay, so another part of exchange rates is obviously the euro has now been covered.